Hi, I'm James McIlvenny, and you're listening to the History and Philosophy of the Language Sciences podcast, online at hifilangsci.net. There you can find links and references to all the literature we discuss. In this episode, our exploration of meaning and language use in the early 20th century goes full circle. That's to say, we return to the Prague Circle by way of the Vienna psychologist Karl Bühler. In his efforts to establish foundations for psychological research, Bühler turned his attention to language. One major result of his linguistic work was his so-called organon model, which conceptualizes language as an instrument of communication. Bühler's theorizing was deeply informed by contemporary disciplinary linguistics, in particular the phonological theory of his colleague in Vienna, Nikolai Trubetskoy and the Prague linguistic circle with which Trubetskoy was closely associated. But the influence between Bula and Prague linguistics wasn't just one way. Trubetskoy and other Prague circle linguists, including Roman Jakobsen, adopted many ideas from Bula's work. In the early 20th century, psychology was a field in flux. It was gaining its first firm institutional footholds, but at the same time was riven by rival doctrines and schools. Throughout the 19th century, psychology had generally been considered a branch of philosophy. The leading psychologists of the 19th century were for the most part professors of philosophy, whose research consisted mainly of introspective reflection about thought processes. Psychology as an independent discipline began to slowly develop around the end of the century as the field took an empirical, experimental turn. In place of the earlier introspection, psychologists began formulating hypotheses to be tested in experiments conducted in laboratories. The first dedicated laboratory for experimental psychology was founded by Wilhelm Wundt at the University of Leipzig in 1879. But we should observe that Wundt's official job title was still Professor of Philosophy, and he still considered himself first and foremost a philosopher. In the following decades, other psychological institutes sprang up around Germany and Europe, but at least in Germany these institutes were still usually under the aegis of professors of philosophy. The University of Vienna was rather late to this game of modern experimental psychology. Although there had been several attempts to establish a psychological institute there, it was only in 1922 that this finally happened, when Karl Bühler took up a professorship at the university. But we should note that Bühler's title was still Professor of Philosophy, although with the additional specification with special attention to psychology and pedagogy. Bühler was a German import who'd been trained in the Würzburg School of Experimental Psychology, one of the many different schools in the early 20th century. Although psychology in this period was finally being constituted as its own discipline, there was no agreed-upon foundation for the field. Instead, this was a period of intense tribal competition, a state of affairs that Bula highlighted and analysed in his short 1927 book, The Crisis of Psychology. In this book, Bula surveyed the main theories current at his time and came to the conclusion that each focused on just one aspect of human mental processes. What was needed was an ecumenical approach that would draw out the specific aspects addressed by each theory and bring them together to create a more holistic view of human thought processes. Bula recognized three main distinctions among the various schools of psychology that he surveyed. There was, first of all, those psychologists who dealt with the problem of internal mental experience of phenomena. This was the central problem of such schools as psychoanalysis, as well as Denkpsychologie, the tradition that Bula himself had been inducted into in Würzburg. It was also the concern of Gestalt psychology, which was closely related to Denkpsychologie. Gestalt psychology we've already encountered at various points in the podcast, in particular in episode 15. Second were the psychologists who focused on behavior as something that can be observed objectively from the outside. The chief representatives of this approach were the behaviorists, who were dominant in America, and who we'll get to know much better in future episodes. The third and last approach was that of humanistic psychology, which was essentially oriented to hermeneutics and looked at the relations between the minds of individuals and the cultures in which they're embedded. 
Hermeneutics we've also already encountered at various points in the podcast, in particular in episode 17. According to Bühler, these three faces of psychology reveal themselves most clearly in language, and it's for this reason that Bühler turned his attention to the study of language. The culmination of his linguistic research was his 1934 book Sprachtheorie, or Theory of Language. Bühler's Sprachtheorie is an incredibly rich book, but here we'll just discuss its first part, where Bühler sets out a series of four axioms outlining the fundamental principles of human language and how it can be studied. The first of these axioms is Bühler's Organon model. The idea behind this model is that language is a tool or instrument that people use in order to communicate with other people about things. His use of the term organon is a reference to the Cratylus, one of Plato's dialogues and a foundational text of European language philosophy. In this dialogue, Socrates, in his role as Plato's sock puppet, describes words and language as an organon or tool that people use for communication. Bula identified three functions that language serves. In the final version of his theory, he calls these functions Ausdruck, or expression, Appell, or appeal, and Darstellung, or representation. Each of these three functions relates to one of the elements that Bula saw as being involved in an act of communication. These three elements are the sender of a sign, the receiver, and the things or states of affairs in the world that the sign is about. So the function of expression relates to the sender. In this function, the sign expresses the inner thoughts and feelings of the sender. The appeal function relates to the receiver. Here the sign appeals to the receiver and directs their behavior. Finally, the representation function relates to the things or states of affairs in the world. The sign represents these things. Each of these three functions also relates to the three aspects of human psychology that Bühler identified. The expression of inner states of the sender picks up on the phenomenological perspective. The appeal that influences the receiver has to do with externally observable behavior. And the representation of things and states of affairs relates to the focus on shared objective culture as understood under a hermeneutic approach. But the sources of Bühler's semiotic ideas are not necessarily anchored in psychology itself. The catalogue of functions that Bühler reproduces in his organon model should be fairly familiar to us by now. If we think back to the most recent episodes, we'll find that Bühler's model is reminiscent of those put forward by such figures as Wegener, Firth, Malinowski, and Ogden and Richards. These scholars all similarly analyzed the communicative situation into components and posited functions linking those components. Bula, who was extraordinarily well-read in both contemporary and historical literature, cited many of these scholars in his writings. Wegener is mentioned often, as is another figure whose work we haven't really looked at in great detail, Alan Henderson Gardiner, a British Egyptologist and contemporary of Bula's. Gardner developed a very similar model of language use based on his experiences in trying to decipher hieroglyphic inscriptions. Gardner's model is set out definitively in his 1932 Theory of Speech and Language. Gardner was also in close contact with both Firth and Malinowski and is frequently cited by them. But one of the things that sets Bühler's work apart from many of these other efforts to study communication in this period is that Bühler's work was much more strongly integrated with mainstream linguistics. Wegener, Malinowski, and Gardner were familiar with linguistic scholarship, and their work had a favorable reception among linguists. But these figures were really pursuing their own interests that were somewhat adjacent to those of the disciplinary linguists of the time. The integration of Bula's work within mainstream linguistics becomes clearer when we consider the other three axioms that he posited as underlying linguistic research. The second of these is the axiom of the sign nature of language. That is, this axiom postulates that language functions as a system of signs. The core idea here is what Bula calls the principle of abstractive relevance. While we might not have heard this term before, the idea it names should be familiar to us by this point. It's the principle underlying phonemic theory, which we looked at in episode 15. 
The principle states that the units of a sign system are defined entirely by abstract qualities that are internally consistent within the system and which, crucially, are not determined by any material properties of the medium in which they're realized. So phonemes, for example, are realized as certain actually articulated sounds, but the range of variation in sounds that can be considered the same phoneme and the boundaries between phonemes are distinctions issuing from the structure of the sound system of each particular language alone. As Buller acknowledged himself, it was advances in modern phonology, in particular as made by the Prague Circle, that inspired him to adopt this axiom into his theory. Indeed, he first elaborated on this point using the example of the difference between phonetics and phonology in a 1931 paper published in the Prague Circle's journal. But there are two fundamentally different kinds of sign in language. Words or morphemes are not only signs but symbols. That's to say, they carry referential meaning or serve the function of representation. They refer to things and states of affairs in the world. Phonemes, on the other hand, are also signs, according to Buhler's definition, but they're not symbols. They only serve to distinguish one word from another, but do not themselves carry referential meaning. This principle is usually referred to today as double articulation, or the duality of patterning. In its present-day formulation, the principle is generally attributed to the post-World War II work of the French linguist André Martinet, although discussion of this feature of language can be found in earlier works, including in the writings of Saussure and Humboldt, among others. Buhler's third axiom answers to the Saussurean distinction between langue and parole, which we discussed in episode 12, and the closely related but somewhat different distinction between ergon and energeia that Humboldt proposed. These two oppositions are essentially concerned with the difference between a concrete instance of language use and the abstract potentiality of language. Starting from these oppositions, Buhler elaborated his own fourfold scheme with the parts Sprechhandlung and Sprachwerk, which in English are usually rendered as speech, action, and language work, plus Sprechakt and Sprachgebilde, usually translated as speech act and language structure. Sprechhandlung and Sprechakt look at language from the perspective of an activity, how people actually use language in practice. Sprachwerk and Sprachgebilde, on the other hand, look at language structures. Each of these pairs is then divided up into different levels of formalization, as Bühler puts it. The Sprechhandlung and Sprachwerk are concerned with specific instances of language use. The Sprechhandlung is a specific utterance, and the Sprachwerk the linguistic content of the utterance, or as we might say today, the text. Sprechakt and Sprachgebilde, on the other hand, abstract away from the specific instance to reach a higher level of generalization. To illustrate the distinction between Sprachwerk and Sprachgebilde, let's look at a grammatical construction in English, such as the so-called split infinitive. One famous example that might come to mind is the quote, to boldly go where no one has gone before. If we talk about this specific quote, then we're at the level of Sprachwerk. But if we talk about split infinitives as a structural feature of English, we're at the abstract level of Sprachgebilde. Buhler compares this to how numbers work. We might talk about a pair of eyes or a pair of socks as specific instances of the numerical quantity of a pair. That would be the equivalent of Sprachwerk. But for the abstract concept of pair, which would be equivalent to Sprachgebilde, the actual items that form the pair are irrelevant. Sprechhandlung and Sprechakt similarly involve different levels of abstraction. The Sprechhandlung is a specific utterance, while the Sprechakt involves analyzing the utterance according to the more general semantic and pragmatic categories that it manifests, to use present-day terminology. Buhler's fourth and final axiom states that meaning-bearing elements of language are divided into a two-class system. The first class is made up of words or morphemes, and the second class of sentences. Words or morphemes serve to break down the world into things, processes, and so on. Putting these words together in sentences then allows us to reconstruct these elements and the relations between them. 
Buller points out that linguists had long been interested in this problem. We may recall the distinction between concepts and relations in 19th century language typology, which we looked at in episodes 3 and 6. Once again, Buller compares this aspect of language to numbers. Our decimal number system consists of 10 numerals from 0 to 9, which can be combined through the syntactic means of place value to name an infinite range of numbers. We should note that the distinction in the fourth axiom is different from that made in the duality of patterning, which we discussed a moment ago. The duality of patterning is concerned with the fact that the meaning-bearing elements in language are made up of other elements that have no meaning, whereas this fourth axiom is concerned with distinguishing between the different kinds of meaning-bearing elements in language. Buhler's axioms show that he was both a keen reader of contemporary linguistic scholarship, especially the new structuralism of the Prague School, and eager to contribute to its further development. Let's now turn to how Buhler was received by the two Prague Circle linguists, Trubetskoy and Jakobsen. Trubetskoy's 1939 Principles of Phonology, his definitive work on phonological theory, adapts key elements of Buhler's Sprachtheorie, Trubetskoy not only took Buhler's principle of abstractive relevance on board as the fundamental principle underlying phonology and linguistic science more generally, but he also adapted the three functions of the organon model and applied them to sound systems. In a perhaps not entirely faithful extension of Buhler's theory, Trubetskoy argued that the representational function is obviously relevant to phonology because the signifier aspect of words necessarily consists of phonological units. But, he added, the functions of expression and appeal also manifest themselves in phonology. This is, however, the domain of a special subfield of phonology that Trubetskoy calls phonostylistics. Trubetskoy's notion of how the expressive function manifests itself in phonology predominantly has to do with how pronunciation reflects the identity of the speaker, and in this way picks up on aspects of phonology that would today be studied in a sociolinguistic context. The examples he provides are of such things as variation in vowel and consonant articulation and intonation, that we might consider to belong to regional or class accents, or that speakers might use to project a certain image of themselves, such as talking in a very feminine or masculine way. This kind of variation, Trubetskoy points out, belongs to the study of phonology because it is conventional. There are innumerable differences in the speech of individuals that reveal characteristics of speakers. Trubetskoy notes that we can tell, for instance, whether someone is fat or skinny from the sound of their voice. But these differences are determined by the physical properties of the speaker's body and are not conventional parts of the language system. Features of accent, on the other hand, are entirely conventional. Similarly, conventionally determined forms can serve the function of appeal, argues Trubetskoy. For example, in German, or indeed in English, the main vowel of a word can be elongated in order to make an emotive appeal to the listener. In English, or at least in Australian English, it would be possible to say, beautiful. Among the most prominent adaptations of Buhler's work to have been made by linguists associated with the Prague Circle would have to be that of Roman Jakobsen. Although Jakobsen already adopted elements of Buhler's theory into his writings in the 1930s, Jakobsen's definitive formulation of his own functional model, with explicit reference to Buhler, was published as late as 1960 in his essay Linguistics and Poetics. In this essay, which began life as a presentation at a 1958 conference on stylistics, Jakobsen looks at the boundaries between linguistics and poetics, that is, the study of devices characteristically used in poetry. Jakobsen comes to the conclusion that linguistics and poetics are two complementary fields. He demonstrates the ways in which these two fields are intertwined by exploring the functions of language, of which he recognizes six thereby doubling the three posited by Buhler. Jakobsen shares with Buhler the three functions of representation, expression, and appeal, which he calls in his own terminology the referential, emotive, and conative functions. Jakobsen's conception of these three functions is more or less the same as Buhler's. <laughs> 
But Jakobsen adds another three functions to these. He is motivated to do this as a result of turning his attention to the medium of communication. We'll recall that Bula recognizes three components of a communicative situation, the sender, the receiver, and the thing or state of affairs spoken about. To these, Jakobsen added the message, that is, the content of what is said, the contact, or the channel through which the addresser maintains their connection with the addressee, and the code, essentially the language being used to communicate. The function associated with the contact, or channel of communication, is the phatic function in Malinowski's sense, which we discussed in episode 19. The function associated with the code is the metalingual function, which is invoked whenever we discuss the words we use to communicate, such as saying, I don't follow you, what do you mean? Or, do you know what I mean? And so on. When we focus on the message, the poetic function is invoked. This function, according to Jakobsen, involves looking at the formal properties of specific instances of language. As an example, Jakobsen conjures an anecdote about a girl who uses the epithet the horrible Harry to talk about someone she doesn't like. When asked why horrible Harry and not dreadful, terrible, frightful, or similar, she replies simply that horrible fits better. An analysis under the poetic function would point out the auditory echo of the two words, horrible and Harry. A poetic function of language was already put forward in the 1929 theses of the Prague Circle, the Circle's Manifesto, where it was contrasted to a single broad function of communication. But the elaborated model that Jakobsen published in 1960 had undergone a significant evolution and come under the sway of the new field of information theory. Information theory arose out of American telecommunications research during the Second World War. The starting point for information theory is classically considered to be the 1948 paper A Mathematical Theory of Communication by Claude Shannon, an engineer at Bell Telephone Laboratories. Shannon's problem was to quantify the information sent over telephone and radio connections as a foundation for a formalized mathematical approach to communication. The goal was to be able to measure the amount of information in order to establish the bandwidth required for transmitting a message, and how much interference could be tolerated in a channel before the message would degrade. Jakobsen would seem to have come into contact with information theory through his acquaintance with Warren Weaver, who, among many other things, was an important functionary in the Rockefeller Foundation, a private American philanthropic institution that funded, and indeed today continues to fund, scientific research. Jakobsen was closely associated with the Rockefeller Foundation as a consultant and funding recipient. In 1949, Claude Shannon and Warren Weaver published the book The Mathematical Theory of Communication, which reproduced Shannon's essay from the year before, with an introduction by Weaver that explains Shannon's theory in terms more accessible to a lay audience. In the 1950s, information theory was bound up with the field of cybernetics. Cybernetics was another of these scientific innovations spurred on by the Second World War. At an abstract level, cybernetics was supposed to be the science of self-regulating systems. Concretely, this field was primarily directed towards the design of computers and robots. It had grown out of the work of Norbert Wiener in World War II to design servo mechanisms for aiming anti-aircraft guns, which together with the human operator formed a hybrid human-machine system that could rapidly calculate the anticipated position of aircraft in the sky and have the gun aimed and ready in time for the human to pull the trigger. From these practical beginnings, cybernetics developed the ambition of explaining systems across the natural and human worlds, and indeed of providing engineering solutions to problems in these worlds. Biologists, anthropologists, and psychologists were active participants in the cybernetics community. As Bernard Gergen points out in his 2011 paper, From Information Theory to French Theory, not only Jakobsen, but also the French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, who we met in episode 15, looked to cybernetics as a master science that could explain human language and culture. 
Jakobsen saw information theory and cybernetics as scientifically rigorous paradigms whose application to language would bring linguistics into the modern age. He assimilated the classical Saussurian notions of langue and parole to the information-theoretic concepts of code and message, which Claude Shannon had given a precise mathematical definition. Interestingly, Jakobsen seemed to embrace information theory with its notions of code, message, sender and receiver as a way of returning the act of communication to center stage in linguistics. Linguists, felt Jakobsen, had fallen into the habit of fetishizing the forms of language without considering what those forms are actually used for, what they actually mean. This approach to linguistics, which actively banished meaning as a valid topic of linguistic research, was particularly characteristic of the school that formed around Len Bloomfield in the first half of the 20th century. We'll talk more about Bloomfield and the Bloomfieldians in coming episodes. But information theory was perhaps a strange saviour for meaning in language. Information theory assumes that there's always a single definite message that is transmitted from sender to receiver using a fixed code. The sender and the receiver, and the context in which the message is exchanged, may have an influence on how the message is encoded and decoded, and noise may interfere with the message. But there is always a single message that is in principle recoverable. Shannon and Weaver, in their 1949 book, insisted that information theory was not concerned with meaning. However, Weaver did allow for the tantalizing possibility that information theory, at the very least, laid the necessary groundwork for the study of meaning, and that meaning might very soon be within its grasp. But this story of senders, receivers, and codes is a long way from the approach to meaning we met in the previous episodes. Such figures as Wegener, Lady Welby, Firth and Malinowski all treated meaning in a way that we could broadly characterize as hermeneutic. That's to say, they emphasize that exchange of words and other meaningful symbols is an active process both for the producer of the symbols and those trying to interpret them. There are constraints on interpretation. It's not the case that anything goes. But there is room for genuine ambiguity and different interpreters might legitimately arrive at different meanings. Indeed, the meaning that arises in a particular situation might even surprise the producer of the symbols. Let's end this episode by looking at Bühler's own fate. In the 1930s, in lockstep with Germany, Austria came under the sway of fascism, which made Bühler's position in Vienna extremely uncomfortable. Matters came to a head in 1938 when the homegrown Austro-fascist dictatorship was overrun and absorbed by Nazi Germany. After being harassed and arrested by the Gestapo, Bula left Central Europe, and like Jakobsen and so many other European scholars, eventually landed in the United States. By this time already over 60 years old, Bula never really gained a foothold in America, and ended his career as a psychologist in private practice in Los Angeles, occasionally teaching at the University of Southern California. He did continue to write, however. While he never went to the extremes of Jakobsen, Bula incorporated elements of cybernetic theory into his later writings, such as his final book, the 1960 Gestalt Principle in the Life of Man and Animals. Bula's adoption of cybernetics perhaps represents more of an effort to make himself relevant in his new intellectual home of the United States, rather than any deep or sincere engagement. In the past few episodes, we've looked extensively at how science and scholarship were driven out of Central Europe in the early 20th century by fascism. In the next episode, we talk to Christopher Hutton about those who stayed and accommodated themselves to the new regimes. (laughs) 